All right, well, uh, thank you for coming here. Um, <laughs> I realized after writing all those slides that I'm actually in Seattle, and there's probably people from Boeing who might be watching this. Uh, my apologies in advance. Uh, <laughs> it's not, there's nothing against Boeing in particular, but uh, definitely there's slides on aviation, and it's only two big companies, so we'll get there. Um, there's a lot of slides. Uh, you will find them online, uh, linked to the talk, or you can use the URL that's uh, here, and that will give you um, a way to get back to them because we cannot go into all the content right now. I mean, I can't go through every single slide in line because there's a lot of content. All right, so this is about um, failures, uh, learning from other people's failures, so that hopefully, hopefully you don't have to do them yourself, and basically uh, being ahead. So... You can think about how often are we repeating the same mistakes in security, um, how often are we taking the same shortcuts with uh, sometimes bad consequences. Um, you know, the whole, like, I should have known better, but why is it that I didn't at the time? Um, also, there's obviously a computer conference, uh, open source, open hardware, but we have a lot to learn from the uh, aviation and medical industry because they obviously deal with similar issues, but as they say, when bad things happen, people actually die. So um, they pay a, more, a bit more attention than we do. And the whole point is, you will never, hopefully not again, say, is this right? I kind of look like I fixed the symptom, so it's probably okay. No, the answer is no. And generally, to be able to grow a spidey sense uh, in case, um, once you've read enough things, you can see, oh my god, this looks similar to something I read about. So, yeah, basically, if it doesn't feel quite right, it probably isn't. And I'm sure you've dealt with people in support where they say, oh, well, the problem is gone, so it must be fixed. I can go back to what I'm doing. And the answer is no, not even a little bit. Um, so, in, for instance, you know, I had an issue with my wireless. You know, you power cycle it. The problem is gone, as in it's gone for now, but it's obviously not fixed, right? So did I fix it? Can I go back to other things? The answer is again, no, I didn't fix it. I just made it go away uh, temporarily. If it's not root cause, it's not fixed. Yes, I know you have other things to do. So do I. And you have to choose what you spend your time on. I get it. But if you, don't, if you can't fix it right now, or real, because you understood what happened, then file a bug to, like, to look at it later, or just be at peace that it's going to happen again, probably an inconvenient time. Obviously, you know that fixing symptoms is only fixing symptoms, so, you know, be wary there. Um, it went away is not a solution, obviously. Um, and as I said, support people um, who are measured by how many uh, tickets they can close uh, have a real incentive to say that the problem is gone when it's not. They're not, unfortunately, being paid to root cause and really fix the problem. They're paid to go to the next person and help as many as they can per hour, which is definitely a bad incentive. So there's really only two kinds of mistakes. Uh, the honest ones that were really have been hard to plan for. When you root cause things after the fact, you say, you know, this one, good conscience, I can't say that I could have seen this one. And then the being too proud, impatient, I know what I'm doing, it should probably work fine. Those are most of the other ones. And of course, you have a few extra ones. But the point is, number ones are not that easy to fix. Number two, however, are much, much easier to fix. Uh, by having a better uh, attitude beforehand. Um, and I have a, probably a good slide that will help you with this. So I know I'm kind of dating myself now, but if you ever watched the old TV show ER, um, when someone actually died and it wasn't too clear that the right things were done, the person in charge was invited to an NFT theater. I would be sitting where I am right now with a whole room of you saying, so why did you do this and give him this shot when you should have done this before and try this thing. And what were you thinking when you did that? And you're like here sweating on stage saying, oh my God, someone died and now everyone's questioning what I did and they're right, I should have done those other things. Um, so the whole point is being grilled like this is not a good place to be. But when you realize that you might end up in that place when you go back in time to where you're actually making those decisions, you're thinking, hmm, if I take this shortcut and I end up on stage later being asked why I took that shortcut, I won't have a very good answer for that. So maybe I shouldn't do this. 
So, we, so yeah, so by going back to the slide, really, that's, I think, in my opinion, the most important slide where if you can tell anyone working in an organization to think that way, and it's not being done with people dying, hopefully, <laughs> but having a post-mortem, and we'll get to that later, um, it will give people a bit more incentive to think ahead. So when does this apply? Well, any time you're thinking, does it? The answer is probably yes. If you're taking a shortcut, I'm not saying you can't take shortcuts, but you have to think, hey, I'm bypassing a process. I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing. If it blows up, do I have a good story? And by that, I don't mean lying. <laughs> I mean, yes, this is what I did. This is why I took a shortcut. This is what I checked. This is why I thought it was safe. And if it wasn't, I was watching it, so we got to reboot it right away, whatever it is, right? Um, so you just have to weigh the pros and cons and know why you're doing what you're doing. So if it blows up, again, you have a good story um, as to why you made those decisions. And, you know, people who are working with you, they realize, well, you weren't just being impulsive or being stupid. You actually thought about the pros and cons, and from time to time you'll make a mistake, and that's fine. But the idea is that companies tend to have a, bigger companies tend to have a profit to try to keep you honest. Uh, but at the end of the day, they have to rely on you because they can't just be behind you questioning everything you do. So I'll fully admit that when I was uh, younger as a sysadmin, um, I made a lot of changes, um, and I was pretty good at what I was doing. So I could do things on the fly, um, make right calls pretty much most of the time. I would sometimes make mistakes, but I was watching what I was doing, catching the mistakes and fixing them before most people even noticed them. Um, so that worked out pretty well. But... It was definitely a one-man show where I would do sometimes changes at night when everyone was sleeping. Um, I was watching it, but no one really knew what I was doing, and they were relying on me not to make mistakes, which, as a human, eventually you will. Um, so this is really not how you want your engineers or your systems to work. Um, I, I did learn that over time, that you know, the fact that you can get away with it for a while doesn't mean that it will work forever. So don't rely on anyone's talent. Even if people you know, are really good at not making mistakes and making the right calls, it's only a matter of time. And also it sets a bad example for other people who might be not as lucky with the choices they're making. So there you go. This is actually, if, if all you learn from the talk is those slides, you've already done a good job because honestly, that will fix a lot of problems. But I'll give you more, more details now. Um, and this is now learning by example so that you can see, oh, Right. This looks similar to something I heard about. So this conference opened lots of things, hardware, software. So very quickly on hardware, um, you know, things I've done, like obviously safety goggles, you have two eyes. The second one is not for redundancy only. <laughs> uh, so wear goggles. Um, most devices nowadays have LiPos. As you know, LiPos only ask for one thing, which, are, which is to make a nice fire that you cannot extinguish until all the uh, lithium has been used up. And if you put water on it, it will be even worse. Um, so as a counter example, this was actually a LiPo battery on one of my RC planes that had a small problem in flight. It did lose both wings. It wasn't flying as well after that. And to whoever designed that battery, you can see it has a very nice, um, I mean, uh, flexible um, thing surrounding the lithium. So actually, despite the pretty heavy crash, the battery did not catch fire, which is pretty amazing. Um, the next thing is you put, uh, not all cells are protected. Some will just empty themselves or overcharge themselves. Um, on those batteries, I use those little uh, monitors that will warn you uh, to avoid either problem. If you are probably more familiar with those LiPos that are in most battery packs inside, if you open them up, or things that you build yourself. Uh, some have a protection circuit, which you can see some do not. Protection circuit is to make sure you don't overcharge them again, because if you do, they might actually catch fire and also to make sure you don't empty them. If you empty a LiPo, uh, usually it's pretty dead after that, and then you have to replace it. So, um, I'm not just saying this for by building stuff at home. Who remembers those Samsung Note 7s that were being banned from all the planes? I see a few heads nodding, right? So this one is actually interesting because that's what you'll, you'll see later as, a, as we get into aviation. It's usually a chain of events. It's not just one person who did something stupid. Um, what happened is they had a battery for a big phone and they realized, oh, this phone actually is not going to last long enough. So let's put a slightly bigger battery. That was done just before shipping. And it kind of fit because, you know, they measured it. So it turns out those batteries, when you charge them, they actually bolt a little bit. And 
there was not much room for the bolting to happen anymore because that new battery was bigger. The next problem they had is suppliers. As you know about the chip problems right now, getting some supply can be difficult. In this case, they ended up having to use two different suppliers for batteries, and one of the two batteries was slightly bigger even. And uh, what happened is then that the battery expanded, there was not much room around it, and that little uh, case that you saw in that crash battery I showed you earlier, that actually ended up touching a screw or scrap metal, and that punctured it, which allowed air to go inside the battery, which allowed, allowed the lithium to uh, find a much better way to exercise its power, which looks like this. Um, so you can see kind of like the space, right, for the battery. Um, if it just expands a little bit too much towards the top, it will touch something there that basically punctured it. So that's why all those uh, phones caught fire. And it's not because one person did something stupid. It's a whole chain of events of, oh, we had to upgrade the battery, then ended up being slightly the wrong size because the other manufacturer didn't do the right thing. And it's just not that simple to catch things like that. So the morals is that, you know, this one is a multi-level failure. Um, and having tests at each level is useful, but having integration tests of the entire product at the end is still something that you should try to have. Because even though you tested every component, when you put everything together, whether it's hardware or software, you could have problems like this. Um, and in this case, they could have added extra fuse, extra testing using uh, users, testing the, the, the phone before it's being shipped, but then they probably had a deadline of shipping before Christmas, so they didn't, and then they were unlucky in this time, in this case. Um, that's actually, I think I invented that quote, <laughs> is that every circuit has a fuse. You have to choose what that fuse is, or if you don't, the circuit will choose for you. Um, so again, you know, if you design hardware, just ha think about what happens if you have a, a short circuit. And then spares, that's just when you're designing things, have lots of spares, especially when there's lead time in getting them. You'll burn things, you'll have the wrong size, whatever. So have a bunch so that you have extra ones when things happen. So other failures, uh, that's a slight segue. Uh, <laughs> that's if you're designing your own things. Um, either in software or hardware, what you've designed is always pretty to yourself because it's like your own baby, right? Your baby is the best baby in the world. Um, in this case, I was designing a hardware for an LED outfit, which was perfectly reasonable to me, but not looking too good to other people. Um, so it was all those bits and wires and things with, I thought it made sense to put an put a amp counter, which is the three-segment, uh, the three-digit display, which apparently everyone thinks is a timer for a bomb. Um, so yeah, when I got to airports with that, they were not very happy seeing this. So I put it in a box, which I thought made it a little bit better, but it only made, turns out, made things worse sometimes because now they have digits moving on top of something they can't even see. Uh, <laughs> so I had a few conversations with uh, bomb specialists in some airports and been detained by police a couple of times. Uh, they let me go eventually, but it's kind of not the best experience. Uh, but however, the idea was to have this outfit, uh, which was a lot of fun to have. All right, so let's go to software. Um, so I do work at Google. Um, We've obviously been dealing with uh, software failures and uh, SRE and sysadmin uh, induced failures for a long time. And you know we, we've learned from other companies and from the mistakes that we've made ourselves. So the first thing we have in our culture is when something breaks, you revert, right? And it's not like, well, I pushed this. I didn't change anything. It's not my fault, but it's not for me to revert. You know, so it doesn't matter whose fault it is. You're the last one who touched the button and it broke. You just revert what you've done, and then you, you worry about it. Turns out it's actually the same thing in aviation, where something really bad happens, you undo what you just did, and then you think about what happened or why. <laughs> um, so code reviews, obviously you know about code reviews, uh, change requests for setups where, hey, I want to be changing something uh, this weekend or whatever, re replacing all the switches, tell people what I'm going to do. And there's two pur purposes of this. Is number one, it forces me to think about all the steps so I can explain them to someone else. And if I miss something, someone else can say, hey, wait, if you do this and this breaks, what's the backup? And then they can question me about it. So that kind of keeps me honest. Uh, for code, you know about unit tests, obviously. Uh, but unit tests, well, I'll get back to them later. Um, postmortem is what I was mentioning earlier, and we, we call them blameless postmortems. They're not like deciding whose fault it is and who gets fired. It's about everyone saying what they've done in which order so everyone can look at it and say, okay, this is where we went wrong, and this is what we want to do differently. 
Another thing we also do is we do practice emergencies and recovery. Uh, we have something called uh, DIRT, which I don't even know what it stands for anymore. But it's basically, uh, actually it's on a different site. Uh, I'll get back to that, yeah. So code reviews, um, <clears throat> even when you work by yourself, um, I find that when I write code, every time I do a git commit, I will diff the code and look at the diff and say, oh, this is what I did. Wait, where is that line here? And then I'll write um, you know, a change log for what I did even though there's no one working with me, just writing that change log, looking at my own code will make me, will force me to look at it and say, is that right? Did I do this for a good reason? Or sometimes I'll find a bug before I even submit it. Um, so really by yourself, it makes sense. Of course, in a company even more so. Um, and at Google, we have something where sometimes you have emergency changes that really, really need to push and you can't get them review, reviewed in time. And we have something called TBR, which means to be reviewed. And it allows you to check something in, and then you tag the name of someone who will review your change after it's being submitted. Obviously, when you do that, um, you have to be really sure you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to make things worse. And the other, the other rule we have is uh, if we do pair programming, then you don't need to have reviews because you have two people looking at the code. So change request, we talked about it a little bit. Um, Everyone thinks, oh, you should just do changes at night or on weekend or whatever. And the answer is actually not necessarily because you're not doing them when you have a proper workload. If your test, uh, your change actually influences something else, a team that's not working, you, let's say you change at three in the morning, you test your stuff, you go to bed, then people get to work at seven while you're sleeping and it all breaks, but you don't know you're sleeping and the team doesn't know who to reach. So there are times where actually doing things in the middle of the day is not necessarily unreasonable. It's just knowing that it's happening. Teams are have to watch what you just did to make sure it doesn't break them. We'll be on alert and watching that. So this, there are pros and cons. It's just uh, consider that depending on what you're doing. So TBRs, we just uh, talked about it basically. Uh, the main thing is TBRs. It's definitely you have to be able to justify why you did what you did, why you bypassed the process. Um, and with great power comes great responsibility, obviously. Unit tests, I think you, you know what they, they are, obviously, but I found that a lot of unit tests are very, very basic. They're almost like compiled tests, and they mock like everything away. Uh, personally, if I can, I will actually have um, an environment that looks just like the real one, and that will replicate what the code is supposed to do. So it's not just like, oh, I, you know, I put two and I got two back. Um, commit queue, continuous in integration. Um, so you probably know about those two, where every code change that you make before it can actually be submitted into the tree, it goes to a, a, a bunch of tests. Some of them are um, done on your machine before you submit. Some are sent to a continuous uh, commit queue, which will take that test, build the tree in a clean environment then run it into VMs to see if it passes a bunch of tests, and even potentially run it on hardware for things like Fuchsia or Chrome OS. Um, now, some tests are pretty expensive, so you cannot run them for every single change that are being made, but those go into continuous integration, and basically they may check you know, 10 or 20 changes all at once. I bunch them up as one, test them, and if they fail, then it, it emails those 20 people saying, hey, one of your, test, uh, one of your changes broke us. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm mentioning on this slide. Um, you also have to deal with flakes. Um, that would be a talk on its own. <laughs> but um, we do have the thing that a flaky test gets worse than no test. So if there are flaky tests, they just get removed or disabled until they're made reliable. Um, and also we do have a bar of how many tests can, can you, uh, are you allowed to fail and still submit? And of course the answer is zero, right? If the test is broken or unreliable, just get the test fixed or removed. Do not just submit because you know a test is unreliable or you think it is. Percent rollout, um, that's obviously not new science either. Instead of rolling out everything to all your machines, you roll out to a few machines to 1%, 5%, 10%, and so forth, right? Um, it's also done on uh, doing safe file updates where if you're changing a big file, there should be something catching the fact that, oh my God, 80% of the files are being changed in this, uh, in this, which is usually, uh, well, it depends on what file, but there were times where people didn't know how to use VI and deleted half the file and then submitted 
um, and I would be caught by those tests saying, hey, my God, <laughs> hey, you know, half the file is missing. Um, we we're talking about commit integration earlier, uh, sorry, about unit tests. Um, so for DNS, for instance, I had one that took your change that ran a real bind server with a new code and that would actually check um, that there were no errors, no warnings. They would even do uh, queries against it to make sure that it's working properly. And only if those pass, then it would go to the real server. So postmodems, we also talked uh, very quickly. Um, so at Google, and there's also links on our uh, postmodem culture, you can look at those later. Um, as we say, revert first. Anyone can request a postmortem. Um, there's always something to learn. And yeah, it's really about facts and timelines, really, not about blame. And it's also on the receiving side, it's humbling to write a postmortem, realizing, oh my God, all those things that I could have done better. So ideally, you don't get there, but if you do, you should be able to learn from that process. I think there's that famous quote of someone, I forget which company, made like a multi million dollar mistake. And the guy goes back to his boss saying, I suppose you want me to resign now. And the guy says, no, I just spent $5 million to educate you. Right? So now you learn from that mistake, don't do it again. So practicing emergencies, also I did mention that uh, it's probably a good idea to do it when everyone is awake and ready, as opposed to a weekend or at night. And that's the, what we do at uh, Google once a year. We actually take out uh, the main office uh, for some services. So it's a whole, it's all instrumented, but the idea is that the main servers go down or become unreachable, and it all falls back, falls back to backups with teams in other offices, and they're not allowed to talk to the main team. Um, that way they're basically forced to go through documentation and through the process to make sure that it works. And it's only if things go really wrong that there's a revert button and then the main team comes back online to fix things. But normally they're not supposed to be doing that at all. Um, and that was an example we had online of something very simple that actually took out a portion of Google production. Uh, the first command looks like a very reasonable command. Um, and what happened basically is on the machine where it was that the user local was already there, everything was great. When it got pushed to production, if that user local wasn't being there, it was being created with a different, different ch mod than the last directory. It made user local untraversable for anything but root, which then broke everything else. And it's something like you would never find this. You'd have no idea. We actually had to go look in the source code of mkdir and file a bug uh, saying this is ridiculous. Um, so there's, you know, no matter what you try, there are times where you'll, you'll hit things like that. Uh, another thing is, of course, when you have automation, um, automation is great, it's fast, it replicates quickly, it's also faster than you can sometimes see that something is going wrong, and we had like a pretty famous example where uh, one bug told our automation to de erase all the drives in the data center um, which we do when we, uh, before throwing them away or recycling them. Uh, but we, in this case, in the for, it happened in every drive of every production machine. Um, and it, the system actually saw the mistake, but the process was so efficient that it deleted everything before they could stop it. So when you have automation like that, uh, make sure there's also a way to catch issues, again, percent rollout so it doesn't go too fast. And of course, you know, check the code to make sure hopefully it doesn't have mistakes, but you can't catch all of them. So we talked about percent rollouts. Um, again, don't be too efficient, right? And, that, and the chmod issue that I talked about, the reason why all of Google didn't go down is because we had percent rollouts. And as it was being rolled out, it took down all those machines and realized, well, we you know, pushed the big red button to stop the rollout and analyzed what went wrong and revert. So postmodems, again, I said there's a lot of links uh, in that uh, presentation, so you can go and look at those links that have a lot more information. So yeah, one thing I learned, so I happen to be a pilot, uh, I'm also a diver, and one thing you learn in both is that um, you need to have a plan before something happens, because when really bad things happen, you lose a good portion of your IQ. <laughs> and having rehearsed beforehand what to do is extremely helpful. In those times. Um, also, and I'll, I'll give you more details about that later. Um, one thing I've also seen over and over again is a temporary fix or a live fix, and then the person goes home. 
And then someone reboots the machine the next day, and the live fix was not committed, and everything's down, and the guy who fixed it is not here, and no one knows what was broken, how it got fixed, right? So anytime there's a live fixed, uh, you should not be allowed to go home until it's documented, until the people on call know what's going on um, and what to do, until it's production and it will basically be okay again. So the idea is, yeah, if you, have, if you make the same mistake twice, something really bad happened, right? The first time it happened, but the second time means that you didn't learn from the first time. <laughs> so, you know, that's really uh, something to be worried about if you have uh, engineers who repeat the same mistakes. Uh, make sure they learn from that. We have an entire uh, book, uh, SRE handbook, that can give you uh, more ideas about this. And yeah, for aviation, um, one thing we said is true is that experience is a cruel teacher. First, they give you the test, and if you survive, then you get the lesson, which is actually very true. But we have a, I'll have a few slides about aviation. I really like this picture because I didn't put that red circle. This is actually how the news article was. In case you didn't know what was wrong in the picture, there's a red circle around it. I was like, okay. <laughs> um, this is the Pan Am disaster, which you may have heard about. You can, uh, you can Google that otherwise. Um, and of course, you, do, you know about the Hindenburg. Uh, there's actually a very good Nova episode that came out recently that explains more details uh, the things that happened. It was not just one thing. It was actually a failure, uh, a chain of events also. So, as I tell people, I'm actually not a great pilot, I'm just an average one. But one thing I learned from um, flying is risk management and being honest with yourself. Knowing that, hey, my skills are only so much, right now, today I'm tired, I'm a little bit sick, my judgment is not going to be as good. Do I really want to attempt this pretty difficult thing today? Or do I want to postpone it or get help? Now, of course, aviation is not just taking a server down, it's potentially dying and killing others. So you hopefully think a little bit harder. Not everyone does, but that's kind of the idea. Um, the other thing I learned is that we're really good at rationalizing decisions and bad decisions. Um, saying, well, it's going to be okay. Yeah, I've done that. It's fine. And the answer is, no, it's not. Um, so we're really good at self-denial, and that's definitely something to fix. I definitely like this one. Denial is not just a river, river in Egypt, which is very true. So... Yeah, if the f uh, fear of a bad review or postmortem, uh, the fear of dying hopefully <laughs> makes you think a little bit harder. And if not, well, <laughs> ideally you only remove yourself in the gene pool, but it shouldn't have to kind of come down to that, right? So, yeah, I kind of found a few interesting uh, slides <laughs> on the internet uh, for this talk. So the next thing is automation, which I already mentioned for, for Google um, and general, general uh, big data centers. Uh, you automate, you can't just do things manually. And aviation is the same thing. Uh, and now we also have autopilots in cars, like you know, Tesla and Waymo, uh, the whole Boeing versus Airbus thing, where Airbus was basically thinking the computer was smarter than the pilot or the average pilot in the plane. So the computer was actually in charge of the plane and the pilot was telling what to do. And Boeing was more like the pilot needs to fly and needs to know what they're doing. And there's pros and cons, there's a very long debate on that. Um, Turns out that Boeing kind of went the Airbus way recently and it didn't work out for them so well. So the idea is that automation is important, it's required, but you need to understand it and know how to disable it and know what to do when something goes wrong. So um, for, for cars, obviously, um, it's kind of the debate of how much you automate and whether you trust the humans behind it. And that's really true for computers too. So the short version is that Tesla, they basically give you enough automation that it will work most of the time, and then they rely on the human to take over when bad things happen, and they can ship it. Um, you can argue whether it's bad or, bad or bad or not. Waymo is the opposite. they basically deciding that a human is not going to be able to take over at all times when some, something goes bad. So they want the computer to be good enough to take care of everything on its own, where you don't even need a pilot in the car at all. Um, the flip side is it's more difficult for them to ship because the problem they're trying to solve is quite complicated. So it's really the same, the same problem for computers. Uh, you may have places where you have operators that are just technicians. They don't understand the code. They don't know how everything works. They just know how to use the automation. If that's the case, your automation has to be bulletproof. Um, and that's kind of what Waymo is doing. 
Now, back to uh, aviation. Um, if you have automation, it means that the operators don't necessarily need to know how things work anymore because they just tell the plane where to fly and the plane goes there on its own until bad things happen and then they don't know what to do. So there's a long thing you can read about it, but uh, Air France 447 was that plane that crashed, uh, I think it was going to uh, Brazil. Um, they were in a thunderstorm, all pitted tubes iced up because of a design default and really bad weather. Those are the things that tell you how fast the plane is going. It had three of them, which is good, but all three of them failed. The plane said, well, I don't know how fast I'm going anymore, so I can't use the automation. So then I'm going to alternate law, which is a completely different way of flying, where now it's actually the pilot flying and not the plane anymore. Except the pilots in the plane, I've never really flown that way because they always tell the plane where to go and the plane does it. And now they actually had a stick that was doing exactly what they were doing on the stick. Um, and it's just they were, not, they were not trained sufficiently. So on top of that, they were in a thunderstorm. It was being pushed up and down. They were panicked. And obviously, as I said earlier, use a lot of your IQ, which is exactly what, they ha what happened. They were not sufficiently trained. They didn't know what to do. Um, and unfortunately, when those pilots decided to pull the nose up because of reasons we'll, we'll never know, um, the really bad thing, and now it goes back to UI and interfaces with humans, the interesting thing is there is there are, there's two pilots, they both have a stick, and one of them, one of the pilots tried to go up, the other one tried to go down, because the, other, the second pilot knew what to do, at least better than the first one. They did not both know that they were flying against one another, and in this case, on an Airbus, what they are, it does is it averages both sticks and basically cancel them out, which is not good. Uh, so that's definitely something Airbus screwed up big time. And now if they kind of wash themselves, uh, they wash them with their hands from it saying, well, you know, the pilots are not supposed to be doing this, which they're not supposed to, but you know, if they're panicked and they're falling out of the skies, humans sometimes are also being humans. Now we look at another one where, thankfully not everyone, actually no one died, um, it's a plane where engine completely blew up and took out half the wing with it and severed all the, uh, a lot of hydraulics. And again, they hadn't planned for that. They literally got 100 errors in the cockpit that they had to look at one by one. And the big thing that Airbus didn't figure out is that some errors weren't so bad and some other ones were really bad and they were not prioritized. And it's only because they had four pilots in the plane that were working together and they were really well trained and did the best job they could have done that they actually managed to land that plane. And even after landing, that engine continued to run for over an hour. No one could shut it down and it was half on fire. And the fact that everyone survived was pretty amazing. But the point is that Airbus didn't quite get, didn't think about so many failures and giving the pilot the most important failure. Now, Going back to automation, um, and again, I'm talking about planes, but think that this is also true for computers, right? If you have data centers and uh, technicians, especially people working at night who are not trained to understand everything, um, the automation has to be bulletproof. And that's kind of what Airbus said. That they sell planes in countries where, honestly, the pilots are not as well trained. Um, in the case of Indonesia, they're actually not allowed to fly to other countries because they won't let them land. Um, and I found this in... Uh, <laughs> When I was flying, which is basically a prayer car and multiple, um, whatever religion you have, you have a prayer that you can say in each religion, which really tells uh, the supreme being to take care of the plane because apparently the pilots aren't. <laughs> so Airbus is trying to make sure that their computers do that for you. Uh, going back on the aviation thing again, a really interesting accident where nothing happened in the end is... They had two planes that started falling out of the sky. They didn't know why, and thankfully they recovered before hitting uh, the ocean. And after doing a very long analysis, um, that's uh, made a TV show that actually goes into a lot of things like that, they found out that they had two data streams that got, uh, they got crossed. So instead of getting altitude and pitch, they got the wrong numbers, and then the computers basically started using the wrong numbers to do things. And in the end, it turns out that it was EMI. Uh, it was interference from unexplained military bases nearby that caused that corruption of data. And when you're doing programming, again, do defensive programming. If you have a sensor that's giving you input and you have one data, a couple of data points that are way out there, maybe they're bad data. Maybe you have a CRC error that you didn't catch or you don't even have a CRC. Um, so, you know, add a few layers of protection in case bad things you didn't think about could happen. 
So since we're here, let's talk about Boeing too, right? Uh, so in, in the old days, Boeing just left the pilot to do the flying um, until the 737 MAX. Well, there was a Dreamliner, but you probably heard about the, the MAX and everything that happened to it. So I'm not here to bang on Boeing. I just want to show you the chain of events of the decisions which one after another caused the outcome. It's not one thing. So it started by having, well, we need to have bigger engines to compete with the plane from Airbus. Uh, but those engines didn't quite fit. So they had to, because the wing was only so high, so they had to put the engines higher up, which then changed the aerodynamics of the plane so that if you fuel the plane a certain way, pitch up, and you put more power, it would go more and more pitch up until it stalled. So it got into a condition where you were in, basically in trouble. So they couldn't really fix that without redesigning the plane, so they said, said well, let's just put some software. So if you get too high, it will stop you from doing it, and it will put the nose back down to stop you from getting into that condition where there's no recovery. And that's what MCAS was. Um, so it's like, okay, software fixed to a hardware problem. Sure, why not? And, well, they kind of figured that late in the process. So they said, well, you know, we have to ship. It's like the Samsung thing, right? We have to ship. There's a pressure. Uh, deadlines had to be met. So... They had to find a quick solution, which was the software. The next thing is they didn't want to change the way the plane was worked, was certified, because otherwise they'd have to go back to a whole certification round, which they didn't want to do because they didn't want to miss the quarter. Again, think about time pressure, making poor decisions because you're trying to meet a deadline. So that's what MCAS was done, uh, was, made for, uh, was made for. And planes have a called AOA's angle of attack indicator, which basically tells you how much you're put, putting up and down compared to how you're flying. And at that point, they were trying to save so much money and rushing it that they only use one of those two instead of using at least a redundant system. So a single failure of that angle of attack indicator would be enough to basically cause the whole system to fail. And the only way to recover was to turn the autopilot on, which no sane pilot would do because that's the opposite of what you're trained to do. And because Air, uh, Boeing didn't want to recertify the plane, they didn't want people to um, know about the system, they kind of just hid it there saying it's there, it works for you, you don't need to know about it. And when it failed, the pilot didn't know what to do, they were not trained, and everybody died. So, you know, things happened, but the point is they were cutting corners. And this is where, again, I'm trying to teach you like, the mindset of how much time are you trying to save, how many corners are you trying to cut. So in this case, at least, if you have a software system that's supposed to make up for all those things, you're going to at least have it designed by hopefully highly paid engineers, right? Um, I mean, how, many, how much would you pay them an hour? $50, $100 an hour, $200 an hour, more? I mean, this is what's keeping the plane flying and everyone from dying, right? Or you could outsource it to India for $9 an hour, which is what they did. And then it wasn't tested or integrated, so it sure helped cut costs, except for all the people who died and the 18, uh, 60 plus billion dollars that they've had to pay in lawsuits, uh, money of not flying, grounded planes, and so forth. So regulation, uh, you can read about more later, but um, the FAA is supposed to help us with that. The sad thing is it's so complicated now that they actually asked manufacturers to self-certify. The same problem with the FDA. The FDA doesn't understand anything about computers. So when there's computers involved, they say, just do it right, make sure it's secure. Because we, don't, we are not staff, we don't have the people who understand that stuff. And as you can probably guess, it didn't really work out that way. So self-safety ass assessment is like, you're shipping and we're trusting you that you've done the right stuff. Well, then you're not regulating anything anymore. Um, <clears throat> so, going back to management, uh, you will probably have some pressure from management saying, hey, you know, why is it not done yet? Why hasn't it pushed yet? And you may be pressured. And that's probably what happened to some people at Boeing. They had to, you know, ship something. Um, and they didn't want to recertify it. But eventually, you know, it's your job to say, you know, I can't do this. It's not safe. I need more time. I need to verify it. We have no unit tests. We haven't checked that the code works. We haven't integrated. Whatever it is, right? It is your job to put your foot down eventually and say, I can't in good conscience, you know, allow this the way it is, which clearly didn't happen. So, yeah, this is the, the list of things that they, 
they did, which they could have, the chain could have stopped at any time, but it didn't. Because no one, you know, no one said no at some point. And it's true that, you know, when you're being rewarded by pushing quarter and so forth, there's an incentive to just let things go because of hopefully it works, which it does most of the time until it doesn't, right? So that's just a few pictures. Obviously, you have nearby, you know what happened on this one, fines, lawsuits, and so forth. They tried to save a bit of money. They lost 60 billion, and it's probably not over yet. So that's probably the biggest, you know, uh, counter example, I mean, biggest example of why you should be careful and not cut corners. Uh, certification, we talked about it. Uh, it's difficult sometimes. <laughs> so the FAA, unfortunately, doesn't always do a great job because they don't, they're not staffed with people who understand all this stuff anymore. Um, and they failed twice. After the first crash, FAA still said it was okay, and it took two crashes before they finally put their foot down. So we talked about all this, FAA, FDA, like the FDA, there's still medical systems using Windows XP connected to the internet, and it's like, really? Um, and if you've seen Karen Sandler's talks, uh, she has a defibrillator, and it was very hard to get a system that didn't have a remote connection with code that she didn't control. She didn't want her heart to be able to be stopped by a buffer overflow of someone in a room that had like, a high power transmitter. And unfortunately, a lot of those systems, they're so badly designed, so pushed so quickly that you can probably think, you, you, yeah, you can probably think that if some of them are vulnerable to things like that. It's just that no one has actually used those attacks yet. And because it's her heart, she cares. So she has a whole talk about that and she's extremely right about it. So the fine print, uh, you can read that later. Uh, there's again more articles that you can read about it just to get more of an idea. Uh, some YouTube talks you can uh, look at. Um, and yeah, training is important. You know, it's important for pilots and it's important for people also. Um, so when you have staff, you know, make sure they're properly trained within what they're supposed to work with. If something went wrong, just undo what was done last. It does, work, does not always work, but it works most of the time. And then you should have pre-done recoveries. Because as I said, you lose half your IQ. So if you have something you re rehearsed, at least you can fall back to that. And conclusions, uh, learn from other people's mistakes, as I just said. Uh, read tech magazines or links to whatever job you're doing. If you see something, say something. Um, that's also true for you know, things that don't feel are safe. Uh, grow your spidey sense. Don't let people bully you saying, hey, we need to push, you're in the way, just sign, just make it happen so we can go forward. And be honest with yourself, you know? If you're taking past your comfort level, say, hey, I need to take a break, I need to review this, I need a second opinion. And of course, for planes and you know, if, uh, medical stuff, wouldn't it be nice if it were all open source so you could have other people help review this? So there we go, I actually made it through the slides. Uh, there's obviously a lot more in them, you can read them. If you have any questions, go ahead. And is anyone on Slack to actually read questions there? Like, I don't have it here. If not, people on Slack can uh, bug me directly. Well, otherwise we're good. I'm glad no one is here working from Boeing <laughs> or Airbus. Thank you for your time. <laughs>